I'm sitting here right now in one of the coolest mule deer places I know of, and it's a place I've wanted to hunt for years. It's the Kaibab Plateau here in northern Arizona, right on the north rim of the Grand Canyon. And the reason that I decided to come and do this hunt is a good friend of mine, Wade Zarlingo. I'm trying to think how many years Wade and I have known each other. Without aging ourselves too bad, let's just say at least 30 years. I've known Randy for, uh, it's been a long time. We knew each other in college. Did a lot of running around, had a lot of fun together. Getting him to say a whole lot isn't always easy. So the camera crew has a little bit of work ahead of him here to get Wade to be this gregarious kind of guy he normally is. But in front of cameras, I'm not sure what the deal is. It's kind of like zip the lip or something. But Wade is, he's been talking to me about hunting this early rifle hunt on the Kaibab, I think for four or five years. And it seems like schedules or something has always gotten in the way of us doing it. And this year, I didn't really have any reason not to do it. Wade and I talked a lot as the applications were coming along and we're looking at the calendar and the season rolls forward or later about five extra days this year. Well, mule deer, November, Kaibab Plateau, Let's apply. And we applied as a party and we got, I think tags 22 or 20 and 23, something like that. We were, we were way up the, the pile of points there. But then after we got our tags, we're looking, well, guess what? It's a full moon the whole time we're there. And I'm thinking, ah, no big deal. We'll get some early weather, be some snow maybe. That'll mitigate everything. Well, forecast is supposed to be really, really warm this week. Warm, windy, and full moon. So there you have it. But there's nothing you can do about that. You apply for these tags because of the experience of getting to come here and hunt. And regardless of what the conditions are, you never know on a place like the Kaibab Plateau when Big Hank's gonna step out. And I've known Wade for a long time and he's the last guy I know of as what you would think of as a trophy hunter. So I have a hard time envisioning Wade waiting for something just really, really big. Maybe he will, but what I know, Wade, he's mostly about having fun, spending time with friends, and getting some meat in the freezer. So I really am not sure what to expect on this hunt. We're right on the Arizona-Utah border. Arizona uses daylight, or doesn't participate in daylight savings time. Utah does, so I use my phone as the <clears throat> alarm it found a Utah cell tower and so we all woke up about two hours earlier than we needed to <laughs> <clears throat> it cuts out of that needed sleep time a little bit yeah I'm already sleep deprived severely well, when that sun comes up on the hill you can get a nap man you promise me yeah. that Wade yeah I'll all right just sit there and <clears throat> look over the country okay Nothing better than sleeping in the woods. You said that. I'm. You're gonna take advantage of it. Uh, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> you bet. You're gonna have some explaining to do if I don't get a nap this morning. Well, so I, th I think we just get up on the hill this morning and we can get a, kind of an overlook of everything that's down below us and how things lay. Okay. And this should get us up pretty high to where we're looking into that transition stuff. A lot of oaks. Okay. I'm so, following you. Yeah, we're just going up the hill. I don't know where, but up that hill somewhere. All right, I'm, <laughs> I'm following him. If I fall asleep, I'll catch up to you. I call these glory tags. And the reason I call them glory tags is a lot of people will draw a tag. It's all oh, once in a lifetime, it's whatever. And this is a very high demand tag. A lot of times the expectation gets set so high that you have a hard time focusing on what is the experience. What are you here for? For me, I hunt for probably three primary reasons. Food, connection with the natural world, and spending time with family and friends. The, those three things are all present here. They're, they're here in abundance on this hunt. So for me to have this tag, even though it's considered a glory tag, I don't have, I don't feel any pressure. 
if I decide, no, oh, that is the time, the place, the buck that just seems like the right thing, I'm gonna shoot. But if I go home with my tag in my pocket, it's not the end of the world. I have no idea where I'm at, so I don't know where I'm going if I don't know where I'm at. You'll get there. You sure I'm not in <laughs> California or something? Maybe. We'll find out. Tags aren't good for California, though. Could be in trouble that way. Let's try heading out on one of these points here and see if we can get to something we can glass. I really don't know what this looks like up here, so. Okay. We'll go up a little higher and kind of work through the cross that way. Stay off the top. Really, I guess. Yeah. I'll follow you. When you're hunting an area as diverse as the Kaibab Plateau that has aspen fir all the way down to the lowest, almost desert type country, you really got to think about what is the season I am hunting. We're hunting the first five days of November. For a mule deer, that's pre-rut. With the peak of the rut here, according to the wildlife manager, being somewhere around November 18th, somewhere in there, 20th. So in a pre-rut situation, you got to think about where are the deer going to be because the unit is so vast. Even though the deer densities here are relatively good, they're gonna be in pockets. They're not gonna be dispersed equally throughout the entire unit. So in a pre-rut situation, the does and their fawns and the young bucks have already left the high country. They don't leave based on snow. They leave based on photo period and browse. So they're already off the top, out of the aspens, through the pines, out into the oaks and even some of the lower country. Well, when you're starting to get close to the rut, where are the mature bucks going to be? Some of them might still be straggling up high, but they're going to start working their way down and they're going to be closer and they're going to be staged in areas where probably in a week or so, they're going to go through and they're going to check some of these does, go back up to where they're staging. Next day, go check. And then finally, it's going to be like, the time is here. Well, when you come to the Kaibab Plateau, you realize how big it is. You realize how thick it is. And, you know, there's the old saying, oh, there's not a buck behind every tree. There could be a lot of bucks here, and as thick as it is, you still wouldn't see them. So there could almost be a buck behind every tree, but I'm not sure I'd find them. Where we're gonna focus are mostly a mix of ponderosa, oaks, and other kind of habitat because those are the places that pre-rut buck, pre bucks are gonna to wanna to hang out. The hard part is that's probably one of the hardest places to try find a mature mule deer buck, especially if it's hot, especially if there's a full moon so they're up moving all night long. It can be a very, very challenging hunt. There's a lot of country to explore here. Later. There's way too much country to explore. That's, that's always the, Tough thing, right? Mm. Right away that first morning, I said, this is going to be tough. The, the oaks and the other brush are over my head and trying to look across canyons and see into places and hope you see a deer, man, that is a challenge. And after that first morning, Wade and I looked at each other and said, you know what, we got to find some places where we can at least look around, where we can see something. And so that's what we did. We went out to some of that lower country out here, where, even below where the oak line is, out into some of that other pinion juniper, cliff rose, stuff like that, a little bit of scattered oaks. And we went out there that evening and we did see some deer. Nothing else, I got a souvenir from the Kaibab.
What do we got going on, Lee? So we're gonna do some baked potatoes in the coals. Got some salad. I don't know who's gonna eat salad though. I'll eat salad. And then we got tenderloins. This elk that Wade came with us. And we shot this elk that this tenderloin is from. When did we do that? A month ago? Wasn't even that long ago. Three weeks ago. Okay, look at that, folks. I don't know what you had to eat tonight, but I can promise you, you aren't eating as good as we are tonight, unless you had elk tenderloin on your grill. I tell you what, Wade Zarlingo. When you retire from game and fish, you might have to just turn into a backcountry chef or something. <laughs> Dang, I forgot to clean this knife. Mm -hmm. We're gonna go out that way, kind of the same place we were yesterday. Okay. The sun's gonna be better. I'm gonna go over here. The sun's gonna be worse. And did you see that, that other truck parked up there? Yeah, we're way down below there. Yeah, he's. He's gonna push him right to you. I know. That's why I got right there. All right. He's he doing a deer drive. He doesn't even know it. Yet. Cool. Good luck. There's a few deer out here. Let's catch one today. Big one. Catch one? Right. Catch one. I don't need to kill one, dude. That's not humane. Uh, I'm kill one. I'm kill one. Good luck. You too. One of the things we were doing is splitting up every day. Because with only five days, you don't want to just all of us go to one spot. By splitting up every day, we're doubling our odds that one of us are gonna see a decent buck. And that morning, as I'm standing there looking, all of a sudden here comes two bucks feeding down below me. Well, I've been up here for about an hour and a half. Sun came up, two bucks. Stayed right down here at 300 yards, feeding and milling around. And then I think they just, once the sun cleared the horizon, I think maybe the lens flare off my spotter or off the camera or something, they caught it and they just looked. And I don't know how long they kept looking, probably 10 or 15 minutes. One of them was about a 22, 23 inch. He had three on one side and was a four by four or a four point on the other with an extra kicker out on his driver's side. So it would have been a five by three, I guess. But he needs another year or two. But I bet you if I had this tag next year and I saw that same buck right down here at 300 yards, the temptation to shoot him would be pretty great. And two years from now, I am 100% certain that he'd probably get shot. But if I'm gonna see deer, I like to see bucks. I'm kinda of getting bored of looking at the same country. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk through some of this thicker stuff and kinda of doing a little exploring, see what's on the ground, what kind of sign we're seeing. Just not picking up too many deer this morning and it, the, the light conditions are perfect for it, but just not seeing, saw one doe this morning. Uh, so far, so tired of sitting. <laughs> it's time to do a little moving and see what we can find. So, let's just see what happens. So one of the things we did is we drove around, we found where Game and Fish was filling one of the water tanks and uh, we talked to them and they told us, yeah, there's water in this tank and there's water in that tank and that tank and it gave an, uh, an explanation as to why there was so much hunting traffic there also is there was quite a bit of water in that area. Well, we're here in the what's called the early rifle season. So you guys have somehow and I tell people Arizona is probably the shining example of how you can provide uh, opportunity be far beyond what you'd expect, but yet retain age class. And you guys, you have an archery season here on the plateau. Correct. And then you have this early rifle. 
Then in some parts of the plateau, you have a muzzleloader season, Correct. and then you have a late rifle season. Yes, and, and an antlerless season for juniors hunters as well. In, in between all that. Yes. Or, wow. So it's amazing that you can provide that level of opportunity and still retain the age class and makes the Kaibab so famous. Yeah, I, managers who came well before I did set up a system that actually works pretty well. Uh -huh. um, those older age class bucks are far less susceptible earlier in the year. Yeah. And so we have those early seasons that you mentioned. Then we have a late season. And those early seasons, typically we see a much higher uh, harvest of yearlings and two-year-old type bucks. Okay. Allows us to control our buck doe ratios a little bit. And then we have the late season where we have those older age class bucks entering the rut, far more susceptible to harvest. Right. Really limited permits, hard to draw. Mm -hmm. um, but if you do draw it, your, your chances for one of those types of bucks is much higher. Really good. And then, so when you issue those late season permits, you always hear people say, oh, you're shooting the gene pool out. You're this, you're that. You guys have been doing this long enough. You know what your harvest is gonna be. You, yes. You're not worried about yeah, the, Ky the Kaibab's blessed with a really long-term data set. We've been running a mandatory check station for all the harvested deer on the plateau for 60 years now. 60 years. And, wow. and so we have a really good feel for, for the level of harvest that our older age class can withstand. And obviously we're collecting data on every deer harvested as it goes through that check station, which enables us to manage at a really tight level those permits on those late season to ensure that we're gonna have carryover for the next year on those older age class bucks. Okay, so when you say harvest and data and information, what, if I'm lucky and I come through your check station, cause it's mandatory, right? Mm -hmm. What information are you gonna be collecting if I were to take a deer? So we're gonna look at, at age. We're gonna uh, take a tooth from your deer and age it exactly within a couple months of how old it is. Okay. Um, if you harvest a yearling buck, we'll, we'll weigh that buck. That gives us an indication of uh, habitat conditions and forage availability because that first year of growth is indicative of what's available on the landscape for those deer to eat. So that expresses more in the yearlings than it does it, in the older deer? It does. Okay. Um, it becomes tempered and the correlation is, is less strong in older age class deer. Okay. And so we measure that on our yearling bucks. Um, and obviously harvest, uh, the number of days to harvest, those are things that we look at when we make our recommendations. Uh, lots of different information that we derive, uh, both from the check station and then from our mail out as well. Okay. It, 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 you'll receive whether you're I already successful did. or not. I got a little postcard <laughs> that said. Perfect, fill that out. It's right. incredibly valuable information for us uh, because it gives us the statistics related to your harvest so that we know if things are, are maybe on decline, yeah. number of deer out there that are available to hunters, um, or incline, and we can issue a few more permits maybe. Yeah. And so the data that's encapsulated in those mail outs is really incredibly valuable for us as managers in the state of Arizona. Yeah. Please fill those out. Yeah, and I mean, you, you're you talking about it here from a big game standpoint, but I think about all the small game species you have that those same surveys apply, whether it's quail, rabbits, squirrels, Absolutely. You name it, turkey. Yep, and we mail, we mail out for small game as well as big game. Uh, and, and much of that harvest related to small game is completely unavailable to us in any other format. It's, we just can't get that information unless the people who are hunting quail and, and, and grouse and, and other small game species fill out those cards yeah. and get them back to us. We don't know what's going on out there without that information. So it's incredibly valuable. So there you have it, folks. We all like to say hunting is conservation, right? It's your job as a hunter, just like it's mine, to fill out these surveys. Fill them out accurately, correctly, and timely so that guys like Todd have some information to work with. So I'm planning my hunt. Every place I'm looking is, is there a water source here? Is there Correct. a water source there? Are these deer, when they migrate from what, 9,000 feet yep. down to 6,000? Yeah, right there, okay. almost exactly. Okay. They, they leave a place that has pretty good water at the high level. Is, am I saying that All right? artificial water. It's Everything all artificial. Everything on the Kaibab. We have one small, about a mile and a half section of stream on the east side of the plateau. Mm -hmm. And everything else that's available to deer is essentially a developed water source. Either a developed spring or an apron with a catchment, um, storage tank and catchment, uh, or a dirt tank. Yeah. That's almost all of the water on the plateau is, is man -made. So if it was not for man putting water on this landscape, it would not be wildlife habitat. That's correct.
That's, that's correct. That's, I mean, people want to think that there's, oh, just this natural cycle, you know, this happy, everything takes care of itself. Well, if there weren't man-made water sources here, there wouldn't be, what, 10, 12,000 deer here? Correct. Correct. And if there weren't 10 or 12,000 deer here, there probably wouldn't be mountain lions and as many coyotes. Exactly. And the, the whole, The whole system everything. is reduced. Absolutely. Where does the funding for most of that water come from? Um, most of our water actually comes, uh, most of the funding for our water developments comes through a process we call the Habitat Partnership Committee, which is what that Arizona Strip Habitat Working Group represents. Uh -huh. um, and that money is money from uh, auction tag sales, mm -hmm. uh, raffle tag sales, uh, the governor's tags, yeah. um, and a myriad of other sources right. as well. Internally, we have Pittman-Robertson money that I mentioned earlier. Um, we have the Forest Service brings money to the table. The BLM brings money to the table. Mm -hmm. um, the National Conservation Resource NRCS, NRCS brings money to the table. Yeah. And all that money can get pooled in the best manner possible to yeah. get these things built on a landscape. Here we've built in the last, oh, 15 years, we've built 18 new waters. They cost between fifty and seventy thousand right. dollars a piece, fairly substantial amount of money, yeah. but dramatically increased our water availability on the landscape. We've got plans for another six, um, and then we've repaired. They're not cheap, yeah. um, and just like everything else, they wear out over time. Right. We've repaired about eighty waters on the plateau 80. over the last few years. Um, wow! <laughs> and, and so um, it's a costly endeavor yeah. to maintain this stuff. Uh, but what I tell people who are critical of that is that it's obvious from Indian runes and, and some of the stuff that you see on the landscape that there was water here in substantial amounts sometime, yeah. maybe a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago. I suspect our activities as humans has probably lowered that availability right. um, from a water table perspective over the years. So we're mitigating our presence on the landscape by putting more waters out there again. Right. And that evening, I took Michael, the camera guy, with me. Marcus, the other camera guy, went with Wade. And with us, I'm guessing we saw 20, 20 does probably with some little bucks. But again, nothing of, of any substance as far as age class on the bucks. But it, it kept reaffirming that the deer are down lower. And if the bucks are going to move into their normal pre-rut pattern and stage a mile or so away from the does, we're probably not too far from where the mature bucks are going to be. Rod's going to kick in here in another week to 10 days. Got to be some bucks starting to move this way. Some mature bucks. I think some of the, the difficulty we had on this hunt is, you know, we had the we had the moon phase that was it was a full moon almost every night of our hunt. And I think what that does is it just it, it reduces that opportunity of those deer in the out feeding. You know, I think that they're they're feeding more in the moonlight, they're going to water, they're doing a lot of their activity, plus the heat, you know, it was it was warm for this time of year and those you know, I just believe that the deer were just a little tougher. The, the bucks weren't coming out. They weren't milling around as much. They had the opportunity to do that uh, during the night. You know, and then we also had, I mean, not that they're excuses, because this is how things happen, but we had a lot of wind too. And I think that added to the deer kind of holding up, you know, on, those, on the windless sides of the hill. And they, I don't think they were moving as much. They were just kind of getting in there where the wind wasn't moving. And the few that we did see, when it was real windy out in the open, they weren't staying around. They weren't feeding, and uh, you know they were they were getting into some cover somewhere. They weren't just milling around for the most part. When it's day three in the hunt, you're kind of thinking, man, have I have I learned enough about this? I've only after day three, you've only got two days left. And so I told Wade, let's drive down to this spot, and if you want to go that way, I'll go this way. And it turned out to be a bus for for me and Michael. We started walking these ridges and glasses and we're running into roads. What showed up on my map as trails actually turned out to be full-blown two-track roads and 
kind of violated my own rules. I always say when I come to a new area, I spend my first day or two scouting as much as hunting. And uh, I let the enthusiasm overtake me. And I spent my first two days hunting and now I'm paying for it because day three, walked into this area thinking, oh, this looks great on the map. No, roads everywhere. Everywhere there's a trail, it's really a road. And uh, so here it is day three. I'm gonna spend most of today scouting. Not a good, not good, but it's a situation I find myself in. We drove all over the place looking, walking out to these points. Yeah, we could glass here. Okay, you could see this much from there. How far is it from water? And that afternoon, we really settled in on, all right, with only two and a half days left, this is our plan and we're just sticking to it. We're either gonna sink or swim with this plan. And that evening, we went out, on, hiked way out on this big rocky point. We could see forever. This is the north rim of the Grand Canyon. See, all the tourists go to the south rim and it is beautiful. But if you really want to see the far away, kind of no one else has been there sort of view, here you go. This is just a little piece of it. Kanab Creek comes in over here to my right. Hits the main Grand Canyon right there. How amazing is that, huh? Welcome to your land. And we saw one doe. I don't know, you don't come to the Kaibab just to shoot a two and a half year old buck. I mean, if you want to, that's fine. I just, I can shoot two and a half year old bucks in Montana. So for me, I'm accepting the fact that I'm gonna see fewer deer and some days I may not see any deer, all for the hope of that one, the one. And I would say the likelihood is if you hunt that way, even on an area like the Kaibab in this early season, you're probably going home empty handed. Oh well, that's the, the joy, the chase, the planning getting your teeth handed to you when you think, oh, this'll work or that'll work and nothing works. That's what makes a hunt. Well, I'll be back here at 11 o'clock. Okay, sounds good, good hopefully, luck. Hopefully I'll have a deer in the back. Yeah. Hope we both have one down. We, don't we have wouldn't to fight. know what to do then. Uh -uh. The wind's gonna blow. Other than to eat tenderloins tonight. True. That'd be all right, That's sitting true. at camp and having tenderloins for the evening. Sign me up for that. All right, let's do that. All right. So with three hard days behind us, day four, I, I'm just scratching my head saying, all right, we hiked into these places, they look good, let's keep checking them out. And so the morning of day four, Michael and I hiked way into this mesa where you could overlook this big drainage. And again, it was the classic, some scattered pine transitioning into oaks. And that morning, we saw a doe, a fawn, and we saw probably another three and a half year old buck, just barely a four by four. I would have thought this basin right here, it's a big basin, it's one of the few roadless basins. Great food, great everything, great bedding cover. A mile and a half from water, I would have thought that there would have been deer in here. Go there to water, come back here. Great in theory. My wife says I'm full of theories. This experiment is proving that my theory slash hypothesis is incorrect. And finally it came down to, all right, let's hunt closer to the water sources. That's where we're seeing all the sign. That's where we're seeing most of the tracks. 
The times we've went really close to water is when we've seen the most deer. Let's do it. We know where there are two water sources. Let's go and hunt somewhere nearby. We'll go to this one. Wade and Marcus will go to that one. And that was the evening hunt for day four. And it worked. Of the 25 or 30 deer that just came streaming by, walking into these water sources, none of them were mature bucks. Forkies, spikes, you know, just not anything you're gonna shoot. Well, let me take that back. Not anything I'm gonna shoot when I'm in the situation I'm at. I've shot tons of forkies and spikes and I was happy to have them. I don't, I don't have any problem with that. But I, I wanted to just keep looking and looking and looking. So with four full days behind us, my strategy, the, the days I've had the best luck have been sitting near water. And so on the morning of the last day, that was the plan. We'll see you at 11. Okay, sounds good. We'll, good night. we'll need all the luck we can get. We're gonna find some. Okay. The last charge of Wade's our lingo and his fearless immortals. Let's do that. One more time. <laughs> good luck. Thanks. try something different. We're going to drive around and try and catch some of these points early this morning and just go out and glass them real quick, see if we pick up something obvious. And if we're not picking anything up, we're just going to get in the truck and drive to another area that looks good. So we've tried about everything. So this is kind of, I don't know, you want to call it, it's not road hunting, but we're definitely moving and trying to cover some ground and seeing what we can find on these hills and kind of the opening stuff in this transition zone. Seems like the place we've seen the bucks driving in and out is kind of in this intermediate where we're dropping out of the pine trees into these oak brush. So that's where we're going to kind of focus on uh, today. Just probably do this for probably three hours and see what happens. of really hard hunting. Unfortunately, day five was a bit like day four, which was a bit like day three, like day two and day one. So I leave the Kaibab Plateau with my quote unquote glory tag still in my pocket. I'm gonna put it in my desk drawer with all the other ones that are unpunched. But I had a blast. I did something that I've wanted to do for a long time. I came and hunted the Kaibab Plateau. I came and hunted with a good friend, Wade Zarlingo. We had the expectations of running down here and finding some, if we worked hard enough, finding some quality deer. Well, that just didn't work, but what it did is it kind of reset what I appreciate out of hunting. I mean, it, 
it made me reset, rethink that what's most important is just the time that we're spending out here with friends, cooking over the fire, just having a good time, the stories we tell, I mean, just the laughter. I mean, it was, we had a really good time. And so it really, it, it makes me appreciate that. So it was, it was a good hunt in that sense. It made me re refocus on the reason that I do this stuff. The deer are gonna win sometimes. The elk are gonna win sometimes. And you gotta be able to understand that that's just part of it. If that frustrates you and bothers you to the point where you can't have fun in spite of that, then hunting is gonna be a frustrating time. But for me, over the years, I've learned that, you know what, some of my fondest memories are the hunts where the tag is still in my desk drawer because it was spent with special people in special places. And I know I tried hard. I know that even though I got frustrated, I didn't pack it up and say, you know, I should go home. I got all this work to do before we go on to the next filming trip. I should do this, I should do that. No, I got five days, damn it. I'm giving it all five days. And that's why I hunt. And I know some people will look at this and say, Randy, you went to the Kaibab, you don't have any footage of big bucks, you didn't shoot anything, blah, blah, blah. You know what? That's why we show these kind of hunts. That's why we tell these kind of stories. Because it's not about filling every tag. It's not about every tag getting filled with some big bull or some big buck. That's not why I hunt. I hunt for so many other reasons that are far more important than what the end result is.